welcome to part three uh, of chapter four, Defects and Imperfections in Crystalline Solids. We talked last time about the two-dimensional or line defects, the only type of line defect we have are dislocations, screw, and edge. Okay? They're related to mechanical behavior. Um, and then before that, we looked at point defects. These are one-dimensional type defects, maybe missing atoms or atoms in locations between the host atoms, those are called interstices, and we call refer to these as interstitial sites. All right, now, we're gonna see also these point defects are gonna be related to uh, processing of materials. I didn't mention that before. So now we're gonna go ahead and do the interfacial or 3D defects. These are the highest energy defects that we have, because uh, now we're looking at large collections of atoms across the surface or between two grains uh, or two phases you know, in a material. So what I've got here is a, a fairly old uh, image of a bubble raft again. These bubble rafts really work well to show these kinds of concepts. But I have these this bubble raft and when this bubble raft uh, was developed Again, we've got the um, hexagonal pattern here, which resembles like a one 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 surface and face center cubic. Okay, so we're just looking at a plane of bubbles or atoms, and I refer to these as atoms now. And each of these regions where this uh, particular crystal structure uh, is occurring is a grain or a crystal. This is a single crystal. Okay, we refer to them as grains now when they're in a material. So there's a single crystal or a grain, here's another grain, another grain at the bottom. All right, so if I was to sort of draw lines here along the, the atoms in my material, I can draw lines along the atoms here in this other grain, you can see the angle difference between the two grains. So these two grains are twisted relative to each other. And this is a fairly large angle of difference. And you can see that when they come together, at the boundary, there's a lot of distortion and a lot of extra space. So this is all the space and distortion between these greens. This is a high angle boundary. So this particular boundary is gonna have the higher energy as compared to the low angle boundary that doesn't have as much distortion. Uh, again, now this is a 2D picture, so this looks like a line. Remember, this is occurring in 3D Right, these grains here are in 3D, and so this is really an entire surface between these grains that we're talking about. All right, so over here, you can see that the grain boundary between these two actually looks pretty good in spots, right? Uh, and you can see that the angle difference between them is relatively small. And so there's some agreement every so often, in fact, uh, much of what is in here are basically dislocations. So it ends up looking like kind of a row uh, of dislocations along this boundary to make up for this small misfit between these two grains. That's our low angle grain boundary. And it's gonna have lower energy than our high angle grain boundary. All right, so I think this picture shows it pretty nicely. I think the one in your textbook uh, is a little confusing because the low angle boundary actually looks worse than the high angle. So think of this kind of picture. Now, if we were to use a optical microscope um, and take a look at a surface after it's been polished and etched, what the polishing and etching does is polishing smoothens the surface and then the etching uh, attacks the boundaries between the grains. So it actually eats the boundaries, and it does that because of the fact that those boundaries have high energy. And so the, the corrosion or the etching to the, the chemical that's put on here, the acids typically, are gonna actually eat away at the boundaries. So this is done relatively quickly, not for very long, just enough to put a groove in between two grains at the boundary. And then when you put an optical microscope on it, most of the light reflects back nicely but when it hits these boundaries, it reflects off and these will look dark. So here's a uh, optical micrograph of an iron chrome alloy. 
And the main thing I want you to just notice here is the grain boundaries. So this is referred to as a polycrystalline sample where it's got multiple crystals um, and also called grains. So one of the things that we would like to be able to do is say something about the size of these grains. So we could just measure diameter and report that, but what has been done is something called a grain size number. Uh, I should mention the reason why we want to put a number on these is that we will also find in the strengthening chapter, actually the smaller they get, the higher strength the material has. And so again, this is a structure this on the micro scale. So we're looking at grains. If we change their size, they change the mechanical behavior of this particular material. Okay. So we'd like some way to characterize the grain size number. This is G, the grain size number varying from one to 10, uh, 10 being very small grains. So what you do is basically take a optical micrograph and then you count the number of grains per inch squared. So you can physically put an inch squared on the micrograph, count the number of grains in it, move your inch squared, count again until you get some a decent number for this. So now we have it in the computer and of course we can we can automate all of this. But this is the way that it was done and this is the way it was defined and our optical micrograph that we would have would be at 100x. So the grain size number is defined as the grains per inch squared 100x. Okay, so n here is the number of grains per inch squared at 100x. We divide by the log of 2, add 1, and this gives us our grain size number. Um, so many times what will happen is you'll go ahead and count grains per inch squared, but your photograph is at a different magnification. So maybe it was taken at 85x, uh, but we still need this grain size number. And so we have to fix the fact that our area that we're looking at is different. If I have a lower magnification, then I'm going to be counting more grains than should be there. Right? So the higher magnification, I'm I'm zooming into the sample if you want, and so an inch squared would see less grains. And so that's important for just remembering uh, in terms of the correction, which way to go. And so I'm gonna see a lower number. So what I'm gonna do is divide 85 by 100. And since this is an area, not a linear, but an area, then I've got a square. So my difference would be the square of 85 divided by 100. So I go ahead and do that, multiply this 62.6, and it tells me I should read something like 45.2 grains per inch squared at 100x, and then I can put that into my formula and get my grain size number out at 6.5. All right, so we got a, a way of characterizing grain sizes. Let's talk about different kinds of, of grain boundaries. So we, we talked about the high angle, the low angle, and then there's a special type called a twin boundary, which has an even lower energy than the low angle boundary. This twin boundary has a special relationship um, between the, in the two grains in terms of their angle, um, their angle of twist here. And so angle of rotation. So if you were to take a crystal structure like this one, for example, and this was the plane that was exposed, you can see that if I match this special angle here, I can get there to be perfect alignment along the grain boundary. Right? They're all sharing this center atom. The distance from this corner to that corner is the same. So I actually don't have any extra space here. Now, the symmetry is different. I know I have more like a kite than I do a, a rectangle. And so there is a higher energy here versus having no boundary at all. Um, but it's not bad and it's much lower than the low angle boundary. So this is actually not a bubble raft up here, but this is a TEM micrograph uh, at atomic resolution. And you can see this twin boundary here and you can see these atoms and then the slight tilt off. So this is like a mirror plane if you want. These are mirrored, these two. If you were to take an optical micrograph of something that has twins in it, because the 
original grain, let's take a look at, say, this. This is a grain boundary that's in here. And so these are all uh, originally grains. And these grains, looks like maybe there's a line through here or something. These grains um, were then distorted or stretched. They were deformed. A load was applied to them. And they resulted in a twinning of the grain. So these sharp lines here represent part of the grain that was <clears throat> that had undergone a, a, a twin, a reorientation uh, of the lattice okay, to accommodate the strain in the structure. And so they usually show up as very straight lines and usually in pairs. So you'll see like here, there's a, that's a bad line. Here there's a twin and then a pair. And the reason they show up in different contrasts is that when you shift the grain like this, you're moving it to a different angle and it reflects the light uh, away from the camera. And so it looks dark. And then um, if you get it to twin back, uh, it will come right back again. And so all of these straight lines you see all throughout here are all twin boundaries. So that's, that's kind of neat. You see that a lot in face center cubic um, materials. All right, that's our twin boundary. Um, then we have the surface itself. So I call this, a lot of times we'll call this the free surface, right? But it's an interface. It's an interface between the solid and whatever environment it's in. Now this is the highest energy. So this is higher energy than the high angle grain boundary. Think about it, the high angle grain boundary still has um, atoms on the other side of the grain. There's just a more open space where the free surface now is missing atoms altogether. So there's nothing out here but our environment. Okay. This one's showing a complicated surface, um, just showing you that surfaces really aren't just flat, but there's actually steps on them as we go from one plane down to the uh, parallel plane below it, the next parallel plane below that one. So you're kind of seeing that idea in your textbook when you were reading about uh, equivalent planes. And these planes, these edges here, or steps, might have missing atoms in them. Um, so these are the kinks. The atom could be floating around on the surface by itself. It's an ad atom. Uh, you could have a hole in the terrace, so that's a vacancy, it's just on the surface. And this is the ledge. Um, you don't need to worry about all of this for uh, our purposes. Main, th main thing we want to think about is the fact that the surface is a defect and it's higher than that high energy grain boundary. So the material really doesn't like to have the surface. And in fact, if we were to melt our sample, let's say this was a sample of gold and we melted it, it's going to want to tend to form a ball, um, a sphere, and that minimizes the total surface area. All right, the other thing we want to know <clears throat> is that the, the surface that's exposed, this plane here, could be any of the planes in our crystal. This could be a 111 surface, that could be a 100 surface, for example. And depending on what surface it is, uh, what plane is showing, it will have a different energy. Okay. And the idea, the basic idea here, concept, is that the energy of the surface is related to the planar density of the atoms of this exposed plane. So let me show you that in picture form. So let's say you have a face-centered cubic material, and I take a look at the structure of two different kinds of planes. This is our 111 plane, and this one's actually a 110 plane, which your textbook has a, uh, a sketch of this one, I believe, as well. So in this one, the 111 uh, plane here has definitely has the highest density of packing, right? The 110 plane, you can see there's whole missing rows of atoms. So when the planar, when the uh, density, the planar density, all right, is high, so as that increases, the energy of this plane 
goes down. I guess I wrote that here for you, but uh, so the one one one, so the energy of the one 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 surface is less than the energy of the one one zero. Okay, this is true for face centered cubic, not necessarily body centered. Right there, you'd have to take a look at the planar density, also the planes you're interested in, to see which one would actually be the lowest. All right. So again, though, uh, even though there's different amounts of surface energy, all of these planes um, would have a much higher energy than a grain boundary. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, much, much higher energy than a grain boundary. I almost thought I said that backwards. I just want to make you a quick chart. In terms of energy, so this would be, uh, let's say, low energy. So it doesn't cost much. Um, to form something on the low energy end. And in fact, if we get really low, like a vacancy, we actually even have an equilibrium number of them. I didn't mention before that when we talked about the vacancy, that the reason why you've got an equilibrium number is that vacancies add uh, disorder into the structure or entropy. So we're lowering the energy of the system through entropy even though it costs some energy to form the vacancies, right? Up to some point, and then it costs more to form the vacancies, in which case uh, we've reached the equilibrium number. All right, but I've got my, my vacancy, my point defects here, and I really don't want to list um, all the point defects in a particular order because it depends on the material. But so I'm going to just put point defects here. So those are all my one-dimensional types. Then my next uh, increase in energy would be my, my dislocation. Those are my 2D or line defects. And then I get to the 3D or surface defects. And here we've got the, uh, I'm gonna put these in order for you, the twin boundary, then the low angle grain boundary, the high angle green boundary, and then the surface. Okay. And so far we saw that for the face centered, we saw that the 111 had the lower energy than the uh, 110, for example. Okay. So I could kind of separate those out if, if I want. All right, so that is the order. Uh, of my different energies. Sometimes something like this shows up on a test and you're asked to uh, place in order the energy or compare the energy of, of various defects. Okay. Just in terms of which one's lower or higher, not in terms of actual values.